oficina interracial en la escuela o entre amigos. Mis estudiantes de DOG dicen que recientemente escuchó a un estudiante blanco llamar a un estudiante negro mono desordenado. En su camino a casa después de la escuela, pero dice que, la, que es la única vez que ha escuchado o presenciado este tipo de incidente y compartió su incomodidad, incomodidad por haberlo presenciado. Como miembro de la Junta y presidente del Comité de Política, he informado para estas experiencias y las experiencias que los padres del distrito han compartido con la Junta y, con, y conmigo. Les pido a nuestros colegas de la administración y de la Junta que exploren cómo podemos desarrollar la capacidad de nuestras escuelas en ayudar víctimas de ataques raciales nuevamente, codificando protocolos detallados, encontrando y, encontrando y trabajadores sociales y psicológicos, creciendo la, cap la capacitación del personal por desarrollo personal profesional para responder a este tipo de incidentes en nuestro manual de políticas escolares. Nuestra declaración y política de equidad es como los cambios de cienes en las políticas de nuestro código se vestimenta escolar y las políticas de LGBTQ proporciona un punto de partida y un camino para abordar incidentes racistas y otros incidentes de odio entre estudiantes. Nuestras exploraciones, cual, cual de las políticas de disciplina y suspensión y expulsión, también brindan a nuestra comunidad escolar la oportunidad de abordar el racismo a través de nuestras políticas escolares. Me gustaría invitar al público a nuestro próximo Comité de Políticas, febrero 5, para ser parte de esta conversación y ayudar a modelar la política que responde a las necesidades de sus hijos y las familias que han, que han sido victimadas de programas, políticas y prácticas que perpetúan y exa, exacerban la inequidad racial, la supremacía blanca y sus efectos. También me gustaría solicitar a nuestro consejo y nuestra administración que adoptemos de inmediato un glosario de equidad racial para definir nuestro trabajo de equidad racial y utilizarlo como una pieza complementaria de nuestra herramienta de evaluación de equidad racial. Esto asegurará que, nos, que nosotros como institución nos responsabilicemos de este trabajo transformativo, importante, pero frágil, al ayudarnos a erradicar la desigualdad en nuestros programas, políticas y prácticas. Por último, me gustaría agradecer a todos los miembros comunitarios de esta noche, que especialmente a los que están ubica, ubicando en su espacio vulnerable a compartir sus experiencias con nosotros, que tal vez sean dramáticas. Lo vemos, lo reconocemos y lo consideramos, compañeros, en este trabajo. De cambiar nuestras escuelas y lugares seguros para nuestros niños. No podemos hacer este trabajo sin su voz y participación. Sergio Hernández. about the racial slurs used by students to hurt other students in our school. And although my heart is broken, I am also not surprised. <laughs> Having grown up in one of the most diverse and yet racially and economically segregated regions in the world, I have experienced and at times perpetuated the effect of white supremacy. Also, I would be remiss to not mention the current national leadership and the toxic environment they have created that emboldens and exposes our country's worst tendencies towards dehumanization and inequity and contributes to the state of affairs in our schools. Growing up as a person of color in the 1980s, my friends and I were the object of racial slurs and discrimination from teachers, police, and even from fellow students, white and of color, like myself. 
I remember being called a wetback, a beater, and a roach coach, and being told to go back to where I came from. I was born in Chicago. As I reflect on my experience of student-on-student -student racial discrimination, I want to make it very clear that what we did as students was learn from the adults in our lives who held bigoted and ignorant views. I learned to hate myself and my Mexican-American Mexican heritage because of these experiences, but also because I found no validation or reflection of who I was in my educational experience. As an educator, I intentionally worked in some of the most marginalized and disinvested communities, my communities, and dedicated myself to correcting the wrong I had experienced throughout my life. I committed myself to being a reflection of the students that I taught, making the curriculum I was told to teach them relevant to their lives and connected to their experiences, and treating their parents as partners in their education and with respect and dignity. Unfortunately, school leaders and some of my teacher colleagues didn't feel the need to do the same and viewed the marginalized children and families we were tasked to serve with disdain and indifference. And when families needed extra supports, many of the school systems I worked for simply didn't have the resources to help them or just flat out ignored their needs. All we seemed to care about was making sure they tested well in third grade and beyond. As a parent, I try to instill empathy and critical thinking skills in my three sons. My wife and I try to monitor the social media and music they listen to while trying not to suppress their independent exploration of our world, and explain that they will run into racism, misogyny, and homophobia. Much of the social media and music of today that I encountered is, like the media I grew up with, filled with violence, misogyny, and homophobia. The only difference is the technology of today makes this more ubiquitous and easily accessible than ever and continues to perpetuate racism, misogyny, and homophobia. I asked my sons about their school experience of racism. My two shoot middle schoolers tell me they haven't heard of any racial incidents at school or among friends. My Daw student says he recently heard a white student call a black student a, quote, disorderly monkey on his way home after school, but says it is the only time he's heard or witnessed this type of incident and shared his discomfort and share his discomfort with having witnessed it. As a board member and chair of the policy committee, and informed by these life experiences and the similar experiences district parents have shared with the board and myself, I asked our administration and board colleagues to explore how we can build staff member capacity and make victims of racist attacks whole again by codifying detailed protocols, staff <coughs> support, staff training, and professional development to respond to these types of incidents in our school policy manual. Our equity statement and policy, as well as recent policy changes in our school dress code and LGBTQ policies, provide a starting point and path toward addressing racist and other hate incidents between students. Our current exploration of discipline and suspension and expulsion policies also provide our school community an opportunity to address racism through our school policies. I would like to invite the public to our next policy committee meeting on February 5th to be part of this conversation and help shape a policy that is responsive to the needs of children and families who have been victimized by programs, policies, and practices that perpetuate and exacerbate racial inequity, white supremacy, and its effects. I would also like to request from our government administration that we immediately adopt a racial equity glossary to define our racial equity work and use it as a companion piece to our racial equity assessment. This will ensure that we as an institution hold ourselves accountable to this transformative, essential, but fragile equity work by helping us eradic eradicate inequality in our programs, policies, and practices. Lastly, I would like to thank all of the community members here tonight, and particularly those who are putting themselves in a vulner vulnerable space by sharing their traumatic experiences. We see you, we acknowledge you, and we consider you a partner in this work of transforming our schools to safe havens for all of our children. We simply cannot do this work without your voice and involvement.
sitting here looking at this standing only room tonight, uh, I'm reminded of several years ago uh, when we had a similar standing room only meeting um, and heard from primarily parents of color who were pleading with us about the, the inequity they were experiencing and how they felt their children weren't being served um, in ways that were manifesting that was manifesting itself in um, the gaps in opportunity to achieve that we've been seeing for years, for decades. Um, that meeting was really a starting point for us to develop a racial equity statement and then later a racial equity policy, um, to doing the beyond diversity trainings and to engaging in all of this work. So, as hard as it is to hear the stories, we need to hear them. As uncomfortable it, as it makes us, that discomfort is where the change is going to come from. So I thank all of you for being here, just like I thanked all of you for being here years ago and for helping to spur the conversation forward. You're here to move the conversation forward again, and I, I, I can't thank you enough for that. So thank you all for being here. Um, I would just like to add again um, my thank you for everyone who's here tonight. Um, I get choked up because a lot of this, these conversations are very personal. And um, I, as a parent, some of the most challenging work that we do with our students is try to walk them through these difficult conversations. And um, like Sergio, I had a conversation with my daughter about race and whether or not she experienced racism at school. <coughs> And so I'm going to invite the parents that are listening and the parents that are here. Have that conversation at home with your student. And you're probably not going to have the answers. But listen. Just take the time to listen. And I encourage you to make use of incredible resources that we have in this community to hold those conversations and hold that space with people of color that are retelling incidences that are hurtful, and in many cases, traumatizing. We live in an incredible community, and everybody who moves to this community prides themselves on the diversity that they move to the city for. And like Suni has said, change is not easy. It's painful, often. And I'm really thankful for the people that we have around this table, uh, for the leadership, in this community, and I am extremely hopeful for a better school district that we, as a community, are going to work towards for our kids. So again, thank you. I am here to listen. Remember and to adhere to the, um, the three minute 
Uh, so say your name and then you'll have three minutes to speak. We will have a timer that goes off at the end of three minutes. We really want to hear from everybody, so um, we will uh, begin. Uh, our first uh, speaker will be Robin Brown. children in the district, my husband is an alumni of the district, and my stepkids are white. I also travel the country as an equity, diversity, and inclusion consultant. You know the saying, you can't be a little bit pregnant? Well, you can't be a little bit anti-racist either. It's an all or nothing proposition. I'm here today because I sense a lack of urgency around the prevention of racist bullying. We know that this is happening in Evanston, right now to our kids. And while I am hearing indignation, I am observing a delayed and lethargic reaction that concerns me. It's time for the district to shake off its sleep and wake up. I am also concerned with some of the language in the letter written by Dr. Gordon, because the letter is centered around protecting families of color. And while that is noble in intent, and by the way, patriarchal by nature, it excludes the fact that this is not only about protecting kids of color. White kids in our district who are hearing and witnessing these racist attacks and are witnessing the slow motion reaction of adults are also at risk. They are being fed a message that it's okay to have these problems as long as you feel bad about them, have some things in place if they do happen, and hope to do something more encompassing eventually. Well, eventually it could be years. And meanwhile, white kids leave the district, never having been a part of a fully overhauled anti-racist culture. Therefore, they will carry the message of eventually into their lives and perpetuate the problem. This work must be done now for the preservation of our families of color and the preparation of our white children to be anti-racist in the world. It comes down to whether we want to create bystanders or interrupters. Please hear me that our students of color who carry the burden of racist bullying <coughs> are victims, but sadly they are being prepared to enter into a world where they will inevitably encounter more. It is the white kids who will be utterly unprepared to be of any use in fighting and dismantling the systems that uphold them and oppress others. They will spread the toxic thinking and engage in the active inaction they were raised on. And if and when we as a community encounter some horror, like one of our children taking their own life, or enacting revenge because the district don't, doesn't act fast or smart enough, then it will be on the district and its good intentions. I don't want that. I know you don't want that. And we don't want that for any of our children. Council of PTAs 
and I have been through several equity trainings and want to view things with an equitable lens. We can continue to offer courageous conversations and support the PTA Equity Project, but no child should hear words such as the N-word or told to go back home to another country. Something needs to change. We need to acknowledge past and present racism and inequity is due to systems. We need to confront racist incidents. We need to educate and support decision makers in their learning about racism. All children should access enrichment opportunities and we need to value past and present minorities for who they are and their contributions to our schools and community. Well done and better than well said. Let's do something about this now. Thank you. is creating and supporting anti-racist schools. Uh, while I'm a career educator, tonight I'm speaking as a parent who has experienced firsthand the silencing of racial injustice at my child's school. These experiences range from, a friend's, from friends' children being called racial slurs on the playground to our parent-teacher organization alienating families of color, such as my own, from school activities and equity initiatives. Our new principal is a supportive ally to our equity work, and I believe that our school and PTA want to be inclusive. However, we need explicit systems and procedures to educate our community, allow us to see our blind spots, and to always center families of color in school policies and programs. Thank you. to call me when she was informed that my, my child was called a chimp, 
a chimpanzee in her class and was made fun of her hair cut, her hair, her texture was called stupid. Um, and uh, forgive me for being emotional, but it's just, it's, it's disheartening. Um, also, in terms of the anti-racism, um, in, in terms of the anti-racism efforts, I 100% support that. Uh, some of the efforts after the incident, the principal, I emailed the principal immediately. Um, unfortunately, she was away for surgery, so the vice principal stepped in and handled the situation promptly. Um, after the incident took place the next day, the um, vice principal called for a immediate staff meeting. Um, and this is after the incident that, that happened. Um, and some of the things that were implemented after this incident was a, a sharing circle. So this sharing circle involved um, the students that were involved in the incident in her class had an opportunity to share how they felt. Um, Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. I'm Thank sorry. you. Thank you. Thank you. 
his hands repeated acts of racism. Now imagine if it was my son that spewed racist comments and was bullying a white student. How would uh, our school staff respond? I'm most certain I would have been notified about the incident. So I, I just think we need to uh, stop being afraid of talk, afraid to talk about race and have these conversations. Not like to challenge the district to create a, not, a no tolerance policy around bullying and all of the isms. Um, and not a punitive process, but a way to teach and learn so that they're going to grow up and our students can learn and grow. So how we can also incorporate race into our curriculum so that all of our kids can do themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Dr. Many, many. 
I never saw an Evanston teacher there. Never. Now, maybe you're doing it now. If you are doing it, that's great. It is imperative that these two parts of the curriculum are used. Are you using primary source documents in the classroom? Are you taking a document in middle school, like the Declaration of Independence, tear it apart and show where it says savages? Come on, this is what's supposed to be done. Now the other thing I'm gonna tell you, you're not gonna lie, but I'm gonna tell you the truth. I was trained to do restorative justice circles about six years ago with Erica Barton. A decision was made to take it away from the police department. Yeah. It has fallen on its face. It is not working. Let me be very, very specific. It was given to a volunteer. It was completely disorganized. I'm not gonna name the school, but I am gonna tell you that I saw a group in a locker room in the gym. And the only reason I had the locker room is because my kids used to go to school there and I knew the teacher. Now, I was called in the end of August, in September, to talk about the circles again. <coughs> Guess what? I called twice. They never asked me to do it. I'm an educator. I know how to do this. I coach teachers. It's not working. You want to talk about racism? You want to talk about anti-Semitism? You want to talk about <coughs> anti-Arab behavior? You want to talk about bullying? Those circles can work. They did when Erica Barton was running them. It doesn't work now. I had kids tell me, share things with me. I shared with them my school experiences. It's not working. If you think it is, forget it. It's not. Unless it's working in the rooms, school rooms, where teachers were trained earlier. The last thing I'm going to say. I was in a school where I see children of color sitting in the office. Yeah. Hours. Yeah. And nobody comes to get them. I had a little girl in eighth grade while I was doing a circle that had her coat on by herself. She could have left the school. No one came together. When I went to get the secretaries, they said, we're too busy. I sat with them. What is wrong with this? I am here as a volunteer. If you need any help, I would be glad to help. But I cannot, I really, I'm telling you now, this is impossible.
I've heard this administration say that the curriculum is going to be revised to become culturally relevant, culturally responsible. Where does that stand? I haven't seen anything on an agenda so far this year. As a white woman, I want white children in this district to learn about racism and whiteness. I didn't learn a thing going through the schools that I went through, which has left me to catch up. Nobody should have to catch up. It should be built in from an early age. The true, they, children should be learning the true history of this country, which was built on racism. This country would not be the country that it is if it weren't for racism. These are just a very few of the systemic changes I believe that need to happen in this district. And we urge you to make them happen so that District 65 can work towards becoming an anti-racist space. Thank you. Tanya Ball. So I think Robin Brown.
basketball season. Tosh is in the fifth grade building. Their coach had taught these girls how to run a fast break, and they were unstoppable. By halftime, the Oakland girls were always up 20, 30 points. Outdone by the Oakland girls quipping on everybody, a few Northside coaches went to the rec department and asked Ms. Palmer to initiate a slaughter rule. Ms. Palmer told them, if those were white girls quipping on everyone like the Oakland team was, they would have never walked into her office. Mm -hmm. Case closed. White privilege. Soccer season. Middle school year. Team Evanston. This turned into a North Side against South Side event. Tasha was playing on Team Evanston. The team was made up of black and white girls, all of whom attended District 65. <coughs> the girls from the South Side, black and white, had played soccer together for years, hung out together. One of the young, one of the North Side white girls sat the white side, white South Side girls. Why they associated themselves with the black girls because they're not your kind. The coach, when made aware of this for the next game, decided to let the girls get suited up, show up to leave for the game, then let them know the game was being forfeited due to these comments. At the time, everyone agreed the punishment was fair. However, looking back, we Southside parents believe the coach should have set down the girls who made the comments, not punish the entire team, and therefore the very girls who were insulted. The coach was from the North Side, and his daughter played. White privilege. Mm -hmm. Indoor soccer season eighth grade. This is a cautionary tale. These same three black girls haven't been playing together now four or five years. Each one loving the sport more than the other. For <coughs> years they tolerated being called the N word for the love of the sport. I feel hamstrung <coughs> this evening and not being able to say that evil, foul, disgusting word that these little girls heard directed toward them for years. Their coaches told them to just ignore it. Neither the referees nor the other coaches said anything in support of the girls. One frigid February night, these three girls had taken enough. They had been called blank for the last time. They came to me and told me they were going to kick some butt. But they didn't use that word. And I said, be my guest. I was as frustrated as they. These three girls followed some white girls into the restroom, and white girls came running out yelling, it wasn't me, it wasn't me. The black girls were still enraged. They vowed to wait outside to catch the guilty girls as they left. Mind you, it was <coughs> February with near zero temperatures. I let them stand outside in the frigid cold for a few minutes and told them they had made their point. Of the three, my daughter was the only one of the girls who continued to play soccer. The other two had had enough. My last quote. Now, why is this a cautionary tale? Suppose the parents of today's black students at these north side schools decide they had enough and allow their kids to retaliate, retaliate the same as I had with these little girls. District 65 would be a war. It's time to do something. Mm -hmm. Florida, where 
when I was a geography teacher, a seventh grade teacher, a student showed up with a Klansman belt buckle on. And the principal told me, well, we'll just have to take that up with the school board because that's freedom of expression. Oh. Um, so moving to Evanston for us was supposed to be our saving grace. My husband accepted a job as the president of St. Francis Hospital. And um, as a stay-at-home mom, I was super excited to be in a space where I felt my black boys would finally be safe. Uh, unfortunately, we've had some incidents. Uh, I love my community. I'll start there. And uh, my pastor is actually here, Pastor mm -hmm. Neighbors. And we, we really do love it here. But when my second grader came home the second week of school and said, Mom, I just don't feel like I belong in my classroom. Mm -hmm. And I said, Cooper, what would make you say that? And he said, well, I'm the only black boy in my class. I was shocked because the year before, there were two other black boys in his class. And I went to the school and I inquired, and there was supposed to be follow-up. Obviously, he's still the only black boy in his classroom. And this is a situation where, um, well, we'll do better next year. But my son has to be the only black boy in his class for an entire year. I want you to think about how that, that impact that has on a seven-year-old. Mm -hmm. Secondly, my sixth grader at Haven, um, same scenario. How's school going? Middle school is middle school. I taught middle school. I get it. <laughs> but the fact remains that he is saying that there are no African-American teachers teaching core classes at Haven. How is that possible? Someone please help me understand. black boy not see one African-American teacher or person of color teaching math, science, English. Why? How is that possible? If you have the answers, I'll take them off record. But if I have to go back into the classroom, if that's what we need to make the change, oh, yeah. <laughs>
it's a little bit more white out there than that. <laughs> that. But um, I left Everton in 2004 when that baby was, I mean, kindergarten, first grade at Warrington because the teacher said something to the tune of white people always being in charge and black people always having to answer to them. That was 2004. I came back to this district very reluctantly. It was not my decision. Literally, God kicked me back here. I wanted to go anywhere but back to Edmonton. I was completely fed up from my experiences in 2004. So I come back in 2018, and um, I'm in the building of the school where my two younger children were. I have an eighth grader and a fifth grader at King Arts. And I've told this story before, but I'm going to tell it again. Um, there were two black boys who were going into the classroom on the last day of school last year. And they were already not going to go into the classroom. I could tell by their behaviors when they, it was time for them to go into the classroom. And literally less than a minute after they had walked into the class, they were kicked out. And the teacher had to lock the door. So the boys couldn't even get back into the classroom. And because I knew them, I walked up to them and I said, you know what's going on? And they're like, the teacher hates us. If we say anything, it's a problem. Other kids are allowed to say things, but it's always an issue with us. And so I told them, you know what? It's the last day of school. You're about to have an amazing summer break. All you have to do is tough it out, get through today. So I went over and I knocked on the door of the classroom. And the white teacher comes to the door. And one of the first things she tells me is, oh, I love your son. I'm going to let that sink in. <laughs> she says, oh, I love your son. What is the difference? between my black son and those two black boys that were standing outside of the classroom. Why did she feel comfortable enough to tell me that she loved my son, but she locked these other two black boys out of the classroom? So in that moment, me as a black mom became a mom of those black boys, and I had to mediate, keeping them calm to get back into the classroom. I had to delicately take care of the ignorance of this teacher and what she had said to me. I had to look in the eyes of the white students who were upset that the black boys were gonna come back into the classroom, and I had to handle everybody's emotions and navigate that to get the black boys back into the classroom. This was 2018. So 14 years after I left this district for the ignorance it showed me in 2004, I walked right back into it in 2018. I've heard so many stories tonight of parents who have had terrible experiences and I feel like I have PTSD because we've all heard the stories. We all saw Trayvon Martin. We all saw Quan McDonald. We all have a terrible story to tell about things that happened in this district. But where are the stories of where it changes, of where it stops? You're doing all of these culturally relevant teachings with your teachers and all these professional development. But here, just last year, you had a teacher show that she wasn't getting anything of what you guys were teaching. I'm going to say this in my closing. When I came back to Edmonton, I was very happy with all the Black Lives Matter signs that I saw all over the place. I thought, man, this is really progressive. But I soon found out that this district and this town is a very Black Lives Matter sign. It's nothing more than that. It is not Black Lives Matter mentality. And until we change that, we will always just have terrible stories. Thank you.
reflection of that, um, but we know that it's foundational and it calls to be built on. Um, another initiative is a series called The Next Step. A group of parents from Nichols and its feeder schools organized the series that uses the book, Despite the Best Intentions, How Racial Inequality Thrives in Good Schools. The authors and sociologists, Dr. Diamond and Dr. Lewis, came to Nichols and will come back three more times in the school year. They talk about their research that shows that schools are not race neutral spaces and unintentionally <coughs> perpetuate racism. This series has been an amazing opportunity to hear directly from experts in the field, and I hope this program can be replicated across the district. <coughs> it has sparked much conversation and offered new ways for white parents to put their values into action. I also want to speak about a group that grew out of Washington schools conversations on racism and equity. Along with other affinity groups, a number of years ago, an anti-racism white affinity group was formed for white people to take responsibility for our own racial education, to challenge ourselves, and to better prepare us for cross-racial conversations and cross-racial action. This group that's now open to parents across the district taught me that humility and curiosity are two of the most important qualities to pass on to my white children when it comes to anti-racism work. Uh, recently, I heard that an expert in the field um, said that Evanston is unique in the number of white people who are willing to get really uncomfortable and go deeper with this work. Um, and that may, led me to another group um, that's doing really important work. Um, the Dewey School PTA hosted a four-part series called Transforming White Privilege that was deeply thought-provoking <coughs> facilitated by District 65 parents. Uh, so in closing, I'll just say that um, in the documentary that addressed racism in Oak Park River Forest High School, Evanston was mentioned as a progressive model in the documentary and in subsequent panels. We, continue, we can continue to be this model for how integrated schools can work for all kids. We've started down this path. If we move ahead with curiosity and humility coupled with courage, boldness, and of course urgency, our schools really will serve every child every day. Megan Kennedy Farrell. My name is Megan Kennedy Farrell and I have two students at Washington School. In 1990, I was a junior at a large public high school. Our new principal announced he was ending the school's tradition of putting a Christmas tree on the outdoor canopy citing a desire to honor the school's diversity, and the community erupted. Hateful, xenophobic, and racist letters to the editor were published in the community newspaper with demands that those people return to where they came from. And students who wanted the tree stage to walk out, emboldened by the hateful sentiments of some adults in the community and the deafening silence of so many others. 28 years have passed, and I still have vivid memories of the racially hateful remarks I heard and read. Vivid memories of the teacher carrying on as if nothing was out of the ordinary. And vivid memories of pained looks on the faces of my classmates of color. But I have zero memories of anyone standing up, speaking out, encouraging critical thinking, or using that moment to educate in any way. The silence spoke volumes. Students whose identities were targeted were not protected, and as Tanya said at the beginning tonight, white students were left unprepared to navigate a future anti-racist world. What if instead, the administration had been working tirelessly to create a culture intolerant to racial slurs and hate speech? What if my teacher had been trained and expected to facilitate bold conversations in the classroom about systemic racism? What if the district had prioritized representation in its hiring practices and my teacher that day had been a person of color? What if, for the previous 11 years of my formal education, the curriculum I had encountered centered the experiences and vast contributions of people of color? And what if someone, anyone, had spoken up? I'm here tonight because I want these what ifs to be my children's realities, our children's realities. I want them to be learning in anti-racist spaces where they have models for what to do when they hear racially hateful speech. I want them to learn about historic and systemic racism so that they can make 
choices, different choices, for our world. I want them to know the truth about the valued contributions people of color have made throughout history and continue to make all around them today. And I want them to dwell in spaces that value the opinions and experiences of their classmates of color. I can't imagine a more valuable learning objective or learning environment. I'm grateful that my children are in this district where some are speaking out and where this conversation is on the agenda tonight. But it's been made abundantly clear in recent weeks and particularly in the experiences shared tonight that this is not at all enough. We must do more. All of our children are watching. Focus 
so far really truly believe that you are, be brave. Don't be afraid. And don't say your whiteness. Thank you. which was developed in concert with and inspired by much of the work by other folks at other schools across the district. I participated in Beyond Diversity here and in the SEED program and really appreciated all that learning. I am still learning. Um, I, part of my urgency in restarting some sort of courageous conversations at Kingsley was my own experience as a kid, a white kid, in a diverse school system that didn't talk about race. And I made a very hurtful comment to a black friend as a third grader. And so part of my, and I was recently talking about this and someone asked me, well, did your parents teach you that? No, my parents were like wonderful progressive folks, but we didn't talk about race enough at home. So I had an incomplete understanding of the things I knew about slavery and from the culture, and I don't want that to be repeated. I think we need to talk to our kids and teach our kids about race and racism. Someone mentioned tonight the social justice standards for teaching tolerance, K-12 standards. I have wondered if that is something that we could incorporate into the schools because it's not enough for those of us who know we need to be talking about race with our kids to do it in our home. We need to do more in our classrooms to prevent kids from making the kind of hateful statements that have been made recently in our schools. I also want to underscore and echo the comments made by Sergio Fernandez about developing very clear protocols, staff training, and ways to respond, um, and of other parents who have commented about things like, how do we make sure that the training that we're giving our, our staff is transferring back into the classroom. So I think this district has done a lot of good and I appreciate the steps that you are taking and we have a ways to go. Thank you. Actually, even happened to me 
person where there is an actual conscious decision to exclude parents of color. Yes. I am currently involved in SEED. Um, I'm currently working with a number of parents and students. And the feedback that I have received, not just from parents of color, but some white parents who are fairly new to Evanston, is that I'm trying to say it nicely. Um, the black parents don't want to be involved. The Hispanic parents don't want to be involved. They really don't care. And if I heard it from maybe one, two, or three people, I said, okay, maybe. And after I heard it, and because it was stated previously that we're not supposed to mention anyone's name that worked for District 65, I won't do that. But what I will say is that my son is an ETHS. He's doing very well, happens to be the only black student in, in many of his AP and honors classes. My daughter is a Haven. I have joined multiple parent groups. I have reached out to all of my friends and family, and I'm just going to end it right here. And I reached out to many Spanish speaking parents and black parents who I was told did not want to be involved in the PTA. And as soon as I recruited them, the website went down for over a month. And I went back and forth with emails and phone calls, even showing up at the school, stating that I have recruited minority parents to get involved in the PTA and the education of their children. And nothing was done. Albert Gibbs. I am a product of District 65 and 202, born and raised in Emerson. I read earlier where I think the title or the topic to this is called, tell me if I'm wrong, it's called Making District 65 an Anti-Racist Space to create emotional safety for all students. Mm. And I think to myself, well, something else I read that spoke to the character of an organization is reflected in its commitment to its community. And then I thought, well, any value of a community or humane society is the treatment of the least of them. That which is at the lower of the rung of the ladder. If you're big or you think you're something at the top, well, the way you treat the bottom says an awful lot about you. Says an awful lot about you. Underrepresentation. I always thought that schools were to be institutions of higher learning. That is, from elementary to college and behind. I've been recognizing that this, this gathering here, this topic tonight, tells me how wrong my thinking of equal education for all students has and maybe still it is out of line. Example, I can say where 10 or so years ago, I would go to a relative's school to see her in different performances during the day, to support her, to 
bridge was the school. I remember when I wasn't welcome over in there. It wasn't because I violated anything. I was just the wrong color. And watching the educators deal with the students as they came out of the assembly after the performance going back to their rooms, I couldn't help but notice how the white teachers had a way of speaking to the children of color that I didn't see them offer to the same people that she were. And when she saw that I was watching her, because the little black kid, he felt like a pity with a hole in it. She was at it. But yet, she showed a loving disposition to the other little white kid. And when she saw me looking at her, all of a sudden her demonstration changed, changed. Well, that reminded me of when I was in school. I can recall where, as a sophomore beginning my sophomore year, all of the black students at Emerson Township High School, we walked out of the school in protest to the racist, discriminatory treatment that we received from the white teachers and the administration. It's pathetic to see that this is still happening now. It's pathetic. Thank you. you say that you're listening, may I just, I'll be one moment. I think we need to establish an elementary school in the fifth ward. your administrative problems. I spoke on this a year or two ago here. Well, I should say when we sought a referendum to have it, to have that to put on a referendum. I recognize that you can listen as you attend to be doing. But listening is one thing, taking action is another. And I'll close on this. How do you recognize that maybe you're racist. Think about that. Well, I'll tell you how. If you see it as a white person, you hear it in your house, at your job, in the supermarket, on the streets, and you say nothing about it. You don't stand up and say, stop it. Cease this madness. You are perpetrating a fraud here tonight. Because it is going on. You're not trying to stop it. You pretend in front of people you're concerned. But I bet you a dollar to them don't know you won't do anything about stopping it. And you can. You have the power. And yet you pretend like it's above anything more than just a conversation. Do the right thing. Quit playing.
we should have more students talking about this topic. Yeah. students in the district 
and what is the racial makeup of the uh, incidents? Is it necessary for them to be dressed in their uniforms in the elementary schools? If so, why? Are the police officers at all schools, and what determines what schools they go into? If they are not in all schools, what are the determining factors and why are they assigned to the specific school? These are questions that require information to be unpacked and to have it clearly specified how the police are used and the, result, the resulting effects. Thank you, and this is a part of OVO, some of the questions that OVO wanted to have addressed. Thank you for allowing me to present. And again, my sincere thank you to everyone who is here tonight, to everyone who spoke. Um, your words were powerful and will be in all of our minds as we continue uh, the discussion of uh, and with that, um, as we uh, prepare the, the next part of the presentation, I hope that as many of you can stay um, so that we can continue uh, uh, listening and learning from each other. I had a bunch of prepared remarks, but I'm putting them aside. I want to first say thank you. I want to thank each and every voice who came forward. I want to especially give another high five to Elizabeth. Yeah. Yeah.
environment of Skokie Madison, we will be a player. I will commit us to be a player as a school district. But this is also a conversation that needs to continue in our communities um, so that we can do the work that's really necessary. I know and I think it's uh, just absolutely marvelous what the um, several uh, parent groups have done throughout the different uh, uh, schools to be able to actually engage in this conversation. This conversation cannot start, stop here. It has to continue. And I just want to, um, again, say from the bottom of my heart that I am appreciative of the voice, um, but appreciation only goes so far. <coughs> Privacy and prompt response is where we will actually make a difference. With that, I want to turn to Joaquin Stevenson, um, who is our Director of Equity and Parent and Community Engagement, um, who will help with my colleagues and me <coughs> lead a conversation about the work that we have underway and the work that has to continue um, as we move forward to create support for anti-racist uh, schools and anti-racist communities. Thank you, Dr. Warren. Thank you, Board, Administration, Community. Uh, I can see I'm in the right place. <laughs> uh, I'm so blessed and welcome to be here today. Uh, I believe that everything happens for a reason based on my belief system, and I believe I'm here today for a specific purpose. Thank you for taking a chance on me, on my hire. Uh, in my 12th week, as I give this presentation, uh, I am not an Estonian. I'm from Humble Park, Logan Square, and I'm proud of that. Uh, but the racial impacts that I see in my community, I see in my community that I serve here today. So we're gonna talk about that as we're talking about creative support for anti-racist schools and communities. Before I start, <clears throat> I just want to say thank you for the, uh, the narratives pain uh, shared in this community today in this space. Uh, we're never going to be at the same place at the same time ever again. And uh, this is truly a place of a start of reconciliation, but that cannot be without truth. So in speaking to that, uh, we must continue to be open and explicit about what is happening in our schools related to discrimination based on our student multiple identities. Um, and as our board members spoke of before, of uh, the multiple identities that we navigate with, me being a brown, cisgender, Mexican-American male, and all that beauty that comes with that, as my mama says, <laughs> uh, we must keep race at the center of this conversation. Race is what we can socialize and recognize first. You can't see my religion. You can't see my sexual orientation, nor that of our students. You can't see my religion if I'm not wearing something that's tangible, a kippa, a hijab, a burqa. You can't see my social class. You can't see my gender expression if it's out of the gender binary that's been socialized for all of us to understand what that looks like. You can't see that in me. What you see is my race. You see brown, you see a, a, a culturally ambiguous uh, presenting man that looks like Jafar from Aladdin. <laughs> but that being said, race is those first. And my six friends that receive PD officers have their own struggles. But one of the first things they ask is, what did they say it looked like? What was their race? And society has taught us to recognize that first. So let us not deny the fact that we don't see race in our community. You see it. We all see it. Typically, issues are placed under a rock, but do not move us forward in D65. Or as we continue to move forward, we need to make sure that we allow that rock to be lifted. And so a metaphor, so bear with me today. Because I try to consolidate this understanding in a way that makes is understanding for me and the students I serve. So typically in our society, we have a, a large range of systems, right? So social, political, educational systems that operate keeping issues of racial discrimination under a rock. So we have this rock, right? And these different pieces of discrimination based on race keep happening, right? Place under the rock, place under the rock, place under the rock. Think of the rock as people are marginalized, people are persons, or person. <coughs> and so that rock, as situations of racial discrimination keep being put under that, that rock starts to lift, and the exposure happens, right? So then what happens is the institution pushes that rock down into the dirt to not allow that exposure to take place. But the incidents, incidents is keep piling up. And so the pressure that rock starts to build. And then the rock explodes eventually. And the system gets hit by pieces of the rock. And they blame the rock for that explosion. What 
what District 65 is moving towards is the lifting of that to make sure that we as an administrative group, administrative body, are modeling what it is for the exposure of racial discrimination happening to our schools and our babies. With that truth, it's important for us to understand as a Beyond Diversity affiliate and presenter and C trainer, for us to understand the difference between technical problems and adaptive solutions. So, leader, I'm going to read this. So, leadership would be an easy and safe undertaking if organizations such as schools and communities only face problems for which they are already using solutions. Every day, people have problems for which they do, in fact, have the necessary know how and procedures. We call these technical problems. But there's a whole list of other problems that are not amendable to authoritative expertise or standard operating procedures. They cannot be solved by someone who provides an answer from up high. We call these adaptive challenges because they require new experiments, new discoveries, and adjustments from numerous places in organization, classroom, or school. This is the difference between adaptive and technical. As Ron Heifetz says in his explanation, and the adapter of this adaptive model, in an adaptive challenge, you can't take the problem off their shoulders and give them the solution. They have to do their part. In the adaptive challenge, people are part of the problem. And their ownership and responsibility taking out the problem becomes part of the solution itself. That's the recognition that every adult in the institution understands that we are all part of the problem, but yet we are also part of the solution itself. Adaptive versus technical. And so in this adaptive piece, as Meg pointed out earlier, is that we're building capacity for our every single adult in this district to be able to have conversations about race and what that looks like in practice in their everyday lives. But that happens only first when there's an introspection about what and how racism has impacted me as an adult. First, I'll unpack that for myself so I can better serve my kids. And so in those continuous action steps towards an anti-racist culture, the first piece is developing culture responsive pedagogy and engaging in curriculum review. So, as a Mexican-American, no, I didn't see anything related to my cultural identity until Dr. Chris Manning at Loyola University in my doctoral studies as a black male allowed me to see myself in reading the book Mexican Lives. Thank you, Dr. Manning, if you're watching. Developing culture responsive practice and pedagogy is a, is a curriculum review that has started. But this takes work and building capacity. As it does with restorative practices, as it does with detracking related to Algebra 8 and Algebra 1 for all students which they, which now are completely detracted with our offerings. Uh, the new discipline code, discipline policies, school-based climate teams, district equity leadership team who use the race forward racial impact assessment to filter through the new discipline and dress code and our administration being open to that incredible feedback from educators that have a heightened sense of racial and cultural competency. District-wide equity, equity statement and equity policy of May of 2017 with the consultant work of Corey Wallace and equity professional development. So with this professional development, the continuation steps that we take related to moving towards this anti-racist culture. You can, you or me, I can say I'm not racist. But that does nothing. Uh, Anti-racism is me moving towards action, and all of us moving towards action. Right? And so, at opening day, Dr. Fermi Samante, I'm from 219, I'm now a family of uh, Fisker 65. Uh, we also had Dr. Amante speak, uh, and now as well, just an incredible uh, spirit and educator nationally. Left great messages for our staff. Uh, beyond diversity, we've trained over a thousand people so far. We have about 500 left, as far as every single adult uh, in the district. And so, those of you who don't know, is Beyond Diversity is a race-based professional development. So it centers on ensuring racial equity transformation. And so what the, what the 
workshop does, and it, being an affiliate of that, is it teaches our staff tools of how to navigate conversations about race using the compass, the four agreements, the six conditions. So if I want to internalize a specific piece, that I can ask members of the audience or us here at this board about how often do you use gender pronouns and how often is that internalized for you? Right, so me, as a straight male, that took a while for me to internalize and understand. But if I didn't understand how to use gender pronouns, that's my work that I have to make sure I do. Just like it's every adult's work in this district to make sure they internalize the protocol of having conversations about race. But it doesn't happen unless you use it. So beyond diversity is an intersection and avenue for all of our adults in the institution to be able to step in and engage. And from that point, the work is their own. And how we can obviously continue to model different other learning experiences like SEED, Seeking Educational Equity and Diversity. We have six cohorts uh, currently taking place, 320 people. When we finish being trained, we have two cohorts with parents. Um, just a, an incredible workshop and going through the isms. Modeling pedagogy in the classroom related to the isms that exist in our society. Uh, the people in the class are the curriculum. Our facilitators are doing an amazing job. ASAAC, uh, <coughs> formerly known as MSAN, district-wide staff racial affinity groups. This is something that's been offered by the district. Unfortunately, uh, it has not been well attended. Now this is offered for every single adult. We have five sessions left. It's being facilitated by Corey Wallace and Kim Kelly. And so it's important that uh, all of us are taking the opportunity to be able to understand what it means for us in racial affinity to be able to dive deep. For our white family members, it's important that you understand what it is to be white. Understand uh, white racial identity development, so in that development, understanding of what that is, you're not leaning on people of color to do the work for you, nor are you overburdening them in the process. So that's why the space is provided. And for people of color, you're able to operate, express, and be in a sense, in a place of community, not having to worry about taking care of the white other, because the systems of power and dynamics do happen in the place of that conversation with white people and people of color in the same place. That's why with the affinity space, you're able to get deeper, faster, and then come together more genuinely with that space. Our cultivating, cultivating consciousness principle trainings, which are uh, being done with the leadership of Adelaide Calgary and also Corey Wallace. Uh, coming soon is our white racial identity development for administration for the spring of 2019. First time administrators are hearing about this right now. Uh, because we're, we're still under uh, development of what that looks like, but we feel like it's very important. I uh, brought up the idea from Joyce Barth and Natalie about how to create a space for our administrators to be able to really unpack what it means for them to be allies in this work for this district. And then building level beyond diversity starting in 2019 2020, so that we do a re revamping of uh, beyond diversity at the building level to drive the work locally for the school. As we continue action steps forward, there's going to be two community circles um, for all of us to be able to engage in conversations and the healing process. And we invite all community members, all teachers, all of our wonderful children that we serve to be a part of this community, uh, sharing circles, so we can model restorative practices that we are offering in schools. February 6th and the 27th, from 6 to 8, we will make sure, I will make sure I send that information uh, with the leadership of the board and make sure all of our community members have that information location. I must admit that the parent commitments in this district um, are incredible in my perspective uh, in doing this work in two other districts. Uh, so we're uh, beyond diversity for parents will be offered in the spring. I have to give a shout out for our Haven Middle School parents for driving that, uh, for us to offer this for all feeder schools, and so this will be open to everyone. Uh, yes, Haven parents will try to be prepared because it was your idea. Uh, we want to make sure that everyone is involved, so thank you for that push. Uh, seeking Education, Equity, and Diversity. See, as I mentioned, there's two cohorts with parents. Uh, Courageous Conversation Series, PTA, Equity Funding, the Transforming White Privilege, as I mentioned, from constituents uh, from Dewey and King Arts. Uh, How to Talk to Your Kids About Race from Dewey Parents. Edison, Cradle to Career. Um, with their mission statement being focused on equity as well. Other parent-sponsored activities, which are also mentioned today. So despite the best intentions, discussion about race, 
White Anti-Racist Book Group, Affinity Group, Family Action, Fan, those speaker series at 202 you have to go to. Uh, Dear Evanston, Racial Justice Book Clubs. Um, and then the parent commitments that we have in moving towards anti-racist culture. Um, there was a few parents who spoke about this earlier related to what our white family members need to do in this community. It isn't enough to have conversations with your kids about race. It isn't enough. How do you live, love, laugh, and play in this community? It, it, it isn't, is it in racial segregation? Our actions are what our kids see. Margaret Hegerman, who was an incredible writer in Time Magazine, published her article on September 4, 2018. In two years, studied 30 affluent families <coughs> in a Midwestern community. Research showed that a critical and influential aspect of raising white kids in America is often overlooked. The social environments in which they grow up, white kids learn about race as a result of their own independent experiences. And I'm going to read a short excerpt, so bear with me, please. It's short. And Margaret says, based on her research, how white children learn about racism in America does not only happen during the interactions they have at school. Everyday behaviors of white parents also matter. When to lock the doors, what conversations to have at the dinner table, what books and magazines to have around the house, how to react to news headlines, who to invite over for summer cookouts, whether, whether and how to answer questions posed by kids about race, who parents are friends with themselves, when to roll one's eyes, what media to consume, how to respond to overtly racist remarks made by grandpa at a family dinner party, and where to spend leisure time, restaurants, vacation destinations, community events, can be deliberately and by default mostly white, or purposely not. These small actions are, are subtle, yet powerful messages Parents may not be, like, be even be aware of this, and that they're conveying ideas about race through these behaviors, but children learn from them all the time. In this sense, when it comes to communication with white children about racism, parents' actions speak louder than their words. The conversations parents have with their white children about race and racism matter. It's not just that so does everything else parents do. Rather than focusing solely on what they say to the kids about race, white parents should think more critically and carefully about how they do and on every, what they do on an everyday basis may actually reproduce the very racist ideas and forms of racial inequality that they say they seek to challenge. And so that's an excerpt from her research. I would also add, based on my lived experience, is my mom as a person of color had to do a hell of a lot of racial identity development for me as a person of color. And so this is the message to my community of color, my family. How are you reinforcing the solidification of foundation of a racial cultural identity of our kids? And how is that reinforced by our teachers? But it starts at the home for our white families and families of color. Whatever our schools are not teaching, this is what my mom said, whatever the schools are teaching you about I'm going to make sure I fill in those gaps. Right? We have to do this in concert with each other and about building capacity. We are working with people in an organization. This takes constant work. We were born, we grew up, and we live in a racist society. This will not happen overnight. This is adaptive work. And we are committed to whatever it takes to make sure that we push forward in building capacity for our adults to still serve our babies, our babies, not these kids, those kids, our kids every day. The community involvement, and I've been blessed to be able to meet the Reverend Dr. Neighbors and Eileen Heidemann as we talk about the partnership of the NAACP, YMCA, House of Worship, and City of Evanston. What you see best for us.
Good evening. I think I'll, I'll, I'll try to uh, begin. Um, I, did, I did prepare a couple of announcements, and I'm going to try to wrap um, what I prepared into a response to, to that question. Um, and, and I want to start by saying, I, I wonder if you all really know, um, if you really know what you're asking. I wonder if you really understand the largesse of this monumental goal that you have of making this district and this community both anti-racist and anti-hatred. And I want to begin my statement by saying that um, it is a noble goal, um, but I think that it is unprecedented in that it has not occurred, in, to my knowledge, in any district or any community in the nation or the world. And so you're asking um, something that's really key and crucial. And I think that the key to this kind of conversation and the kind of goals and objectives that you have set really is going to establish for us how we talk about uh, racism and hatred, not just within the school district, but within the community. And not just within the community, but within all of our individual families, all of our houses of worship. Uh, we're going to have to begin to talk about race uh, when it comes to everybody in our city. Uh, that includes our elected officials, that includes our first responders, that includes our business owners, our company owners, our corporations, um, everybody that uh, has anything to do with our community. If we're going to say that we have a school district that is anti-racist and we have a community that is anti-racist, and anti-hatred, then that is going to include everybody. Uh, certainly, you are concerned because of where you're starting, but I do want to say that a discussion about anti-racism includes a discussion about homophobia, it includes a discussion about Islamophobia, it includes a discussion about anti-Semitism and every other kind of ism that exists um, out there as well. And so I think that what we've got to do is we've got to begin by building relationships by developing bridges between races and ethnicities that are not just professional, such as schools and, and businesses and companies and city issues, but those relationships must also be personal. How do you get parents to begin to talk to each other? How do you get parents to begin to talk to each other that of, are of different backgrounds and, and different ethnicities as well? Um, since racism and hatred are taught, I think that we need to understand it falls upon the community, it falls upon all of those organizations that we talked about already to begin to teach an alternative. We are inextricably intertwined and caught up in a mutual web of interdependence as a community. And I think that the rich mosaic of the human family is something that is cause for celebration. So I put all of that aside and I say this is what we have to do. So this is the plan. So, so, so it's, it needs to be manipulated because it can't just be my plan, right? But these are ideas that I just want to begin with. The plan must include the following steps. It's major, you all, what you're trying to do. Identify racism as a critical epidemic occurring in our community. Take ownership of it. Don't just say, oh, America's always had uh, a problem with race. That, that's an outlet for you. Nope admit that it is an epidemic that is occurring in this community. Number two, if a racist act or words are done or spoken, go immediately to the authorities, whoever that is. In schools, it would be teachers and or administrators. On your job, it would be your supervisor or owner. In public services, it might be a manager, a supervisor. In public spaces, it would be the police. Number three, if a racist act or words happens on your job, address it immediately. Number four, if racism occurs in your neighborhood, contact your neighborhood association to address it. 
Number five, cite racism as a moral issue that demeans and devalues human beings. Number six, demand that public institutions be held, I got a copy for this, y'all. You, you don't have to write it all down. Number six, demand that public institutions be held accountable and offer a plan of action that penalizes those institutions who fail to address and resolve this specific issue. This is the big one, I think. Number seven, have our, have our town adopt an anti-racist, anti-hate zone, all of Evanston, all eight square miles, with appropriate signage placed throughout the community, followed by programs and workshops. Number eight, become a change agent for ending racism and hate crimes in our schools and in our towns. Number nine, whatever you belong to, ask your house of worship, your social club, your business, your fraternity, your sorority, your school to become change agents. And number 10, ensure that it begins with you. Not 
moving, doing the thing that our organization can do to support you, or not providing some of the workshops that you need, moved me. That, you pushed me, because that's what you said you wanted to do. You want all of us to be empowered to make this change. When Reverend Neighbors and I, as community partners, propose something, support it. Encourage people to be part of the things that are going to create change. But if it's just us talking about it, we're sitting in our place of power. I, I have a title, I have a job, I have a, a, he has a huge title, huge job. <laughs> Same. If we're not talking to people who have been impacted by the stories that we heard tonight, it doesn't give an ounce of matter what we decide. And so change the way we think about how we move forward. Moving forward with being led by Olivia and all of her classmates. Move forward being led by people who entrust their kids to us as a community, and we're failing them when we don't support those who have been marginalized and teach those who have been marginalizing them. We can sit and blame parents, parents' fault, it's teachers' fault, it's this, but it, that, it doesn't matter. The, our goal now is to say, what do we do with what is? And we say, this is not okay, ever. And that has to be consistent. It can't be that it's not okay at this school, but it's kind of okay at that school. It can't be one administrator lifts up the, the truth and, and opens it. And I love your image of the rock. You know, just went and took the rock out of the way. Didn't wait. Move the rock, tell the truth, and then we can start to heal. Everybody has to do the same thing. If this is one system that every school has to respond the same way, every kid has to know they will be listened to in the same way. I want to add um, that putting, putting a face to the issue of racism and hatred is very, very important. And I think it's not just important for those who are educators, but it's important for people that are willing to begin to engage in meaningful dialogue. We talked about the courageous conversations that have been going on. And I think that a lot of times, um, African Americans, we're in this situation, I heard someone say it earlier, I think it was Roger, we're always in a situation where, you know, whenever we talk about race, we, it's, it's like we become the teacher and, and, not, and not just the student. And people expect that from us. And they expect that from our kids as well. So sometimes when our kids are in the classroom talking about race, um, they, almost become, they almost become a second teacher, especially like what we've heard earlier, if they're the only black child in the classroom. You know, so the, 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 really, the sentiment is, now how do your people really feel about that? You know, and, that, and that's too much pressure. It's too much of a burden for anybody at, at any age. But I think putting a, putting a face on it is very important. My kids um, caught me, uh, I guess uh, it's probably about a year ago, but it was very, very interesting. We were going somewhere on, vac on vacation, and, um, and so I always, I, I kind of, I, I always, you know, dress up. And my, my kids are always like, well, Dad, my God, why do you have to wear a tie all the time? Or a jacket? And even when we go on vacation, when we get on the, on the flight, you know, I, I, am in a, I am in a jacket and tie. You know, it, it's probably a suit but at least the jacket and tie. And so I finally had to sit down and talk to my kids, my 14-year-old son and my nine-year-old daughter. And I, and, and I said, listen, it, the reason why I do it is because um, I'm a black man. And I'm a black man, I'm, I'm kind of volatile and opinionated. And so, and so, <laughs> I am indeed. And, and so if somebody, if somebody approaches me because they suspect that they can talk to me any way they want to talk to me, or say something that's really going to be outlandish, I don't know how I would respond. So I wear a suit and tie to protect you, because, because with a suit and tie on, 90% of the time, I am completely respected, just like everybody else, whether it's in an airport or whether it's here or there. If I have my hoodie on, or if I have a t-shirt and blue jeans, People don't know me from blue, and they may treat me in a way that's just completely unacceptable. Now, you all know that's insane. Isn't that insane? Yeah. My God, we were going to Cuba, man. It was 112 degrees. <laughs> but, but, but to tell that story, it's just one of a thousand. 
stories that we need to share so that people can understand how this issue of race is so pernicious and so ingrained in every single aspect of our community and of our society and the way that we live. And unless we begin to talk about it, like you all have decided you're gonna talk about it, you all are the ones who invited us here and said, we're gonna have an anti-racist uh, school and an anti-racist community. And that's why I still think that it's probably one of the most amazing goals that I've ever heard anybody make. Who, who came up with that? <laughs> yeah, I wanna know. Who, who came up with it? <laughs> it's a, well, Anya, Anya, that is a business. And I want you to know you have 110% of my support in trying to make that happen. That's a big one. A, a really important thing that I heard tonight was about vocabulary and creating a unified vocabulary. Something that we've been working with right now with the city of Evanston so that we can start to share some definitions, so that people feel a little bit more comfortable having the conversation. I think being upfront about that and being upfront about what, what's the point of that? Why, as each step happens, what's the, what's, what's the point? Why are we doing this? So that people start to, the community starts to understand. Because it's really important that people in the community say, oh, they're never gonna change anything, they this, they're never, but all of those things we say, the rug gets pulled out from underneath those kinds of statements when there's incredible transparency. And when, when people are being told, oh, they've invited actual parents to tell their stories and they're responding to that. Oh, they talked about actual things that have happened in school and they're talking about what's the training that needs to happen so that doesn't happen again. That starts to change the community mentality and then we have to start owning ways to support what you're doing. And by we, I mean everybody, every organization, Every, whatever it is in Evanston, has to be able to say, what can I do so that no six-year-old in Evanston ever has to be talked to in the ways we heard tonight? What, what's my role? I don't have anything to do with the schools, but what can I do to support what you're doing? And part of it is speaking up, and I have to be a person that pulls the rug out from underneath people who are trying to denigrate the work you're doing. And I, I know I loved Ginevra's notion of just don't listen to those people that disagree. I, I was a school administrator for a long time. I know you have to listen. On the other hand, if we have the language to say, here's why we're doing this, here's why, thank you for sharing what you're saying, but here's why we're going to keep going right in the direction that we've set. You may not change minds. You may not, you may grab a few people who didn't understand along the way. But the language that you share with each other is going to give you the power to just keep responding as you keep moving. And I think that's really important. And we want to support you in, in being able to do that. And what y'all have to do since you've started this is you have to, you have to openly and publicly declare war on racism and hatred in this school system. You have to declare war. And you are going to get some pushback from that, but you have to believe that racism and hatred is absolutely antithetical to what beloved community is all about. They do not belong in the kind of community that we, that we believe Evanston can be, and that's what we're working for. So we, we always talk about racism in terms of its history. We always talk about racism in terms of how it has been a part of our society before, but I don't know that there's ever been any public declaration that in this community and in this location and in this school district, we are declaring war on racism and we are going to fight for its complete eradication from our community and from our district. You know, you have to believe that. And, and, and because that's the way that you, that's the way you press forward. Now that doesn't mean you're declaring war on people. Let me make it plain. But you're declaring war on those systems and upon those 
on those organizations and upon those systemic realities that continue to allow racism to fester and, and to grow. So you're not declaring war on individuals, but you are declaring war on that system. And if they are the ones that are feeding into that system, then you're cutting off the feeder. They will no longer be able to feed into that kind of system. And we all have that. It's a, again, it's not just the district. You're not alone in this. It's in, our, it's in our entire community and it's in our entire city, in, in our entire nation. But who says that out of Evanston cannot somehow uh, exist the seed for finally allowing our nation to w wake up and recognize we have, we have fussed with this reality of racism for so long as a nation. Now it's time to eradicate it. Now it's time to declare war. You declared war on poverty, you declared war on drugs, you declared war on every little thing, but nobody's declared war on racism. It is evil and it is wrong, and it needs to be eliminated.
is an added layer to my everyday. And then I sat down and I said, Joey, I saw you in gym shoes. <laughs> so um, I think, I, and I've already said this before, we need to start tracking the incidences. Um, Reverend, it's not going to go away. But I think if we're able to track the times that this is happening in our district, it equips us to see those gaps at our schools to provide support to our educators, to, to provide um, support to our community members. Um, and it's just as serious as somebody getting into a fight. It's just as serious as somebody, um, this is a, an offense. It's not a physical offense, but the emotional baggage and trauma that this is causing is really a humongous burden for our children to carry. Um, and we're the type of community that is talking about it. And I hope that in 20 years, we're not still talking about it. Because it's exhausting. And the people of color in this community are exhausted. And people who, are, who live in this community, we're all immigrants in that instance. We all came here and made choices because of the beautiful environment, um, you know, that's next, next to Lake Michigan, um, houses that, you know, people feel safe, an incredible educational system. And I hope that, again, that we can start tracking these incidences and that through the, the collection of information on how we're responding in that every school is responding the same way. And that every school has the resources to make kids feel safe in every possible way, physically, emotionally. It's, it's important.
who we need to listen to and who we don't, right? Who has to plead for change and who gets to demand it? Everybody. And we, we, we need to respond to the pain and suffering that is happening um, the way that we would, right? If the way that the, our institutions and our communities have historically to whiteness and, and wealthiness. Like we, the reason why our community looks the way it does is because we have not listened. We have not listened, we have not responded, we have not get elevated or empathized with the deep trauma and pain that it's been experienced. And, you know, it brings adults to tears. How can we expect children to learn if they are burdened with this pain? Um, so I felt like we needed to have this discussion and I'm really grateful that we have the support of our community to do this. Um, and, and we need healing. Our adults and our children need healing. Um, it's healing for me to see this institution respond and validate the experience of the, the terror that many people who are marginalized feel. Um, that's a heavy burden, and we need for our institutions to acknowledge that, that burden that, that we're carrying on behalf of really our, our entire country, right? Every time we experience a microaggression and we, and we put on our responsibility politics to, to try to protect ourselves in some way that keeps peace for other people. And that is a heavy burden for all of our, all folks who are marginalized to carry and that we're passing on to our children. And then we're asking them to, to learn and be pro-social and joyful while they carry these heavy, heavy burdens. Um, to the point of what Ms. Shepard was talking about, her children standing outside in the cold. I mean, they were dehumanized so much that they wanted to harm the humanity of someone else. And none of us want to be in that place. And I think that the only way we can make sure we're not putting anyone in the place um, of feeling so angry that they feel like the only thing they can do is lash out is taking responsibility and validating and acknowledging what people are experiencing. Um, and I, as a black woman who's an elected official, I have not been immune to having experienced feelings of racism and microaggressions. I've been accused multiple times of not living in my neighborhood in front of my own home. Um, had people otherize me in so many different situations constantly asking me if I'm the nanny of my own children. Um, and asking my other friends who are parents of color if they are nannies of their children. Only because folks see a woman of color who is at home with her children and assume that I must be working, that I can't actually have the opportunity to, and the wherewithal to be home with my children. Um, these those experiences are painful, and it's it is painful to experience that in front of my children. It, it feels like an indignity to be forced out of my parental role into right a, a feeling space. Um, I've had I feel like oftentimes I have to tout my accomplishments or by degrees in order to get people to listen to me. Um, or I had to teach my daughter about African-American vernacular because oftentimes that's not how I talk, but then if I'm with my friend, I might slip into <laughs> my African-American vernacular English and she's like, oh, why do you talk like that? <laughs> and that's, my, that's how I feel comfortable talking. That's, that's how I feel comfortable relating and, and having fun. I should be able to be that person all of the time. So I'm, I'm glad that we're having this conversation and I understand that for some people it's uncomfortable, um, but for me, it's really sharing a little bit of the discomfort, <laughs> I guess. I, get, I have to feel uncomfortable a lot as a black woman, I have 
have the folks who are carrying a lot of discomfort. And children deserve to go to school and feel fully alive and feel fully present and fully loved. And if we as adults have to get a little uncomfortable in order to do that, then I expect that we do it. journey that I do think we need to 
to help our kids, but we need our kids to help us. So thank you, and thank you all for, for pushing this and making this conversation. Um, I'll just add that this is such an important conversation, and this is something that is um, an extremely ambitious goal and not something that, that we are going to um, see happening anytime soon. We're not, we're not going to achieve anti-racist schools all of a sudden by the next school year. Um, but what I appreciate all of the efforts that we are, have put in place now and, and realize it will take some time to, to see the effects of that. But I, I do also believe that we have to put in place some more short-term So we can see some more immediate changes and make the call to um, ensure that our discipline policy recognizes acts of racial aggression as, as violations that need to be noted. Um, it is something that is hugely important. You know, as I was listening to all the stories tonight and, and you know, reading what people um, have, have emailed to us, talking to people, uh, you know, remembering my own uh, schooling as uh, the only Indian child in an in all-white school um, from a very small, primarily white community in, in Indiana. And when I think about, you know, uh, yeah, like I, there was one time when a kid hit me, but I got over that. The things that I have never really gotten over are, you know, the, the time that um, my new second grade reading teacher decided that my name was too difficult to pronounce, and so they would just call me Sunshine, because she thought that was acceptable. Um, and I didn't have the language to say, that doesn't feel right, because Sunshine is a nice thing, and I guess she's being nice, but no, she wasn't. Um, and then my after revenge on her, I actually don't remember her name, so I think that's my name. <laughs> <laughs> I'm fixing her name, but she was just funny. Um, I, I remember, you know, when I had a crush on a white boy in my class being made fun of by the other students because what, we're gonna have black and white zebra babies? Um, how would that work? So those are the things that even as an adult um, stick with me and I apologize. Um, and those are the things that are gonna stick with my kids. And so that's why it's important that we, we, we acknowledge the harm that's being done it um, and validate for, for the students, for the families, um, to know that we take it seriously. So I think that's an immediate step that we can at least put in place to track these incidents and treat them with the same seriousness that we treat other um, acts of aggression. Um, I think I know that there are some of our principals who are doing such brave and bold work um, in our schools. Uh, I know we've highlighted, um, and I know people are talking about Lincolnwood with, with Max Weinberg, you know, Adrian Harries has done some things at Nickel, and I know there are other principals who are doing good work. I think we need to make sure that we are lifting that up and using that as an example. I know some schools are creating restorative circles for parents within the schools, and I know that we're doing that on a community-wide level, but I would like to encourage all of our principals um, to engage in this work at the building level um, and create these spaces for um, your families and for students. Um, I think in terms of, you know, I appreciate Lizzie's comment about we have to, because the system is part of the problem, we really have to think um, outside the box and beyond the system. And so, you know, let's, I would continue to uh, push, and I know that I have um, several board colleagues who will continue to push for, let's look at different ways of how we define success and achievement. Um, it isn't just math scores. And while I don't want to, well, while we don't need to get rid of those and say that that isn't important, let's be expansive in what we, can, what we how we define student success. And knowing that maybe there is a perfect system already out there, then let's create it. Um, and let's show that our students that they are more than a test score. Um, so those are just some, I think, that I think that we can think about it, we can put in place more immediately. We don't have to wait for you know, sort of the long-term um, uh, you know, product of, of all of the trainings and everything. So um, I am appreciative of all the work that we've done. Um, I know sometimes <laughs> I come off as being impatient that it's happening faster and things aren't changing. I, that isn't 
because I lack the appreciation for everything that has already happened. We do have, in so many ways, such an incredible community. I think the, the number of people that were here earlier and spoke is just a testament to the will that we do have in this community. Uh, I know that the will also <laughs> exists to stop this episode forever in the community. And so it's you important know, to know that we have community partners, that we have community members who will support us in continuing um, so, I, I appreciate the, the work that's done so far, and, and let's just keep it going and keep it moving and, and not be weary. One, um, one plug, so the Essential Five survey is out. Uh, one of the things that we talked about today is our student voice. Um, as Adults, I think that we need to be hearing from the students who are in these classrooms. And this year, we have extended Essential Five survey from fourth to eighth grade. Um, we actually do read the information from those surveys. I know that is just another survey, but as we're talking about student voice, I think that it's very important that schools are promoting this survey and that it's not uh, taken lightly. Um, the the results from from last year, there are some schools that really pushed it. Um, their, their communities to take the essential five, some not so much. But I can tell you that of the schools that did fill in the information and the feedback that we did get, um, that has helped to shape a lot of the conversations that we're having. So um, the, the survey is open until February, uh, February 15th, the survey is open now. That's a survey that's, that's available to students, uh, staff, and families. So I just ask that families, please take the time to take the survey, it takes five minutes. Um, it's really helpful um, for us uh, to get that information back. And again, as we're asking our, for our student voice, this is one tool that we have already. And so I would like to challenge our schools um, to find creative ways, um, exciting ways to let uh, families know that we have this, this tool now um, that they can fill out and um, share their, their perspectives on their experiences at school.
several of our principals here tonight. Mm -hmm. um, our principals have this as part of their professional learning. We'll have more of this as part of their professional learning as we go forward um, and as we debrief and think about how we operationalize uh, uh, the work. But the, the circles that have been going on in Washington Elementary, uh, the, um, a couple weeks ago at Lincoln Wood, there was the first annual community dinner that took 450 people to fill Wood uh, together as a community. Um, there's fantastic work that Mr. Harris is doing uh, and very great work at, uh, at Nichols around uh, uh, affinity groups and being bold about that. Uh, there's Black Student Union issue. Uh, Mr. McCollum has uh, opened up uh, those doors and has done uh, just some wonderful, wonderful work uh, there. Um, and, and I can go down the list of uh, many different principles. So leveraging those principles who are allies is very important. And I do want to highlight and uh, honor the fact that the president of the teachers union is here tonight. Mm -hmm. And so in the institutional structures, those are institutional structures that, um, that, that sometimes are warring factions. And, uh, um, and this, uh, this evening, uh, Meg Crowley is here, um, first and foremost as an educator, first and foremost as a parent in the system, and first and foremost as, uh, as the president of the teachers union. So I want to give her um, the acknowledgement that she deserves on behalf of our teachers because that <coughs> that will also start to get translated into many of the questions that have been asked of um, and can we just put on the table. What's really going on in classrooms? And it's the um, it's the partnership uh, Anya mentioned this earlier that we've been doing with um, uh, with our union uh, and really thinking about how we structure that relationship so that we can translate that into Teachers can be the easy targets for some of our anger, and sometimes that's warranted. But I know in our district that a lot of teachers are doing the work um, and are, are really, really committed to doing what they need to do to transform their classrooms and to transform our schools and to push us to be better in the district. So I truly appreciate that Meg is here um, tonight and all the support that she's offered.
understand that they're, that they're experiencing something differently than the intrinsic, but that is real and it deserves to be heard. Um, and then I, I want to highlight something that I heard tonight and I've heard in other occasions that I've actually also experienced is a culture of exclusion and using exclusion, like weaponizing that, um, and adults utilizing exclusion, whether some, someone is in or out, or a part of or not, as a, a tool of control or power. I think that we all need to think about, do we have a value of inclusion or exclusion? And how are we modeling that? And how are children then learning to include or exclude? Um, and I heard some of that tonight, and I think that we need to in include that as part of our thought process. Um, we need to model for children the value of inclusion and the value of